I would like to thank the uh, committee and the conference organi organizer uh, to uh, uh, provide me with the chance to uh, present my research at uh, this conference. And so uh, I'm currently at the Cincinnati Children's Hospital, so my training background actually is a psychiatrist and a genetic epidemiologist. So uh, I'm trying to sort of uh, um, present today's talk in a way that the, the focus will be more on the, 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 the finding and a little bit about, about the approach. And so uh, if you are interested in the detail, the technical detail about the, the quantitative approach, and, you, know, I, you are more than welcome to let me know and we might have uh, further uh, discussions or conversation after the meeting. So, uh, so today's topic is, is trying to figure out that what we can learn from the gene environment in the action uh, of autism. Well, as many of you uh, are aware that uh, well, autism used to be thought of a very highly inheritable disease. If we take a look at the number of the heritability, it used to be the one of the highest, uh, the, uh, you know, pediatric disorder with the highest heritability, like almost uh, 70 percent. That means that in the variation in variation within the phenotype, 70 percent of the variation can be explained by genetic factor. But new evidence emerged. Uh, and kind of try to help us to revise the concept about the genetic contribution to autism. For example, recently that uh, a California-based population study, a twin study, have found that if we include more uh, twins in the, in the cohort that the heritability actually might go down to only 50 percent. It depends upon the definition of autism. And so that kind of get us thinking that is that because environmental factor actually are playing a bigger role than we expect. Another interesting, or I would just say interesting, more like a tragic fact is that we know that the prevalence rate of autism has been increasing in recent years. I mean, back in my old day in medical school, we, we kind of learned that the only one in maybe uh, 1,500 kids can be diagnosed with autism. And nowadays, according to the newest estimate from CDC in the U.S., one in every 68 uh, school-age kids can be diagnosed with autism. So the dramatic increase of the uh, prevalence rate kind of gave us, uh, you know, uh, keep us wonder that. Is that because the estimate issue or the increase of awareness issue or because of environmental issue? You know, we kind of think that genetic factor mutation rate is supposed to be static across time, across generation, but the environmental factor is something we haven't really got a good grasp on that. So today I'm going to start with that, why we think that gene environment, environment interaction is important, not only for the reason of the increased prevalence rate, but also another important issue in, uh, in research, which is heterogeneity, and what we can learn from heterogeneity, and what are the methods that we can use to study the, the, this, this uh, phenomenon. So uh, autism spectrum disorder is probably one of the most com uh, complex disorder in pediatric psychiatric disorder because of if we only we diagnose the kid based on the, the criteria from any kinds of uh, you know protocol or any, any kind of a, a manual that you can see that uh, those kids actually they are quite different. So for example, this slide I'm trying to show that if we break down the clinical domain of autism into different kind of a developmental milestone, like the, you know, the like birth way or there's language development, has a conference, et cetera, et cetera. I found that the distribution is hardly a, a sim, a sim, simply a, a symmetrical Gaussian distribution. They kind of indicate that they, well, at least one of the single distribution might be actually come from multiple uh, normal distribution, which in also suggests that there are multiple different genetic pathway that lead to the same disease in the in the in the, in the whole population. So one of the quantitative approach, I uh, you know my colleagues and I have been trying to do is that if we assume that uh, you know a skewed distribution, you know not a perfect symmetric distribution, we try to assume that. What if it is composed of two or three or even four different distinct Gaussian distribution? Then we assume that each single distribution is the more homogeneous population. We might be able to have a better chance to identify a better genetic signal. So based on this kind of quantitative concept and, and algorithm, 
uh, I use the age of the first words uh, as, a, as a quantitative tree, and then we eventually we use the uh, maximum likelihood algorithm to estimate that there are at least three different uh, normal distribution. So you can see that the, 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 the left one, on the left-hand side, this one is like the, the early onset for age of the first word, meaning these kids actually, they have the diagnosis of autism, but their language development seems to be okay. They speak kind of early compared to their peer with the same diagnosis. And we found that using the linkage analysis, we can identify the, 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 to the top hit on chromosome 11. And on the other hand, if we focus on the, this group right here, and they seem to be have a later onset of their first word, seem to be have delayed speech development. And using the same approach, we identify different genetic signal. So this is kind of a, you know, lends some support to our idea that based on the breaking down the distribution of the one single quantitative tree, we will be able to, to, to identify more homogeneous subgroups and identify different signal. And if this is real, I mean biologically, clinically, then we have some sort of a tangible evidence to show that, yes, this is why that the autism is, is heterogeneous because we really need to look at their, their clinical symptom in this kind of a, you know, quantitative approach to identify a subgroup without a, pre, a priori or arbitrary cutoff to determine who is late onset, who is early onset. Another way to, to look at the so-called how do we use the genetic marker to identify the homogeneous subgroup is that we try to reverse the, the, our, our concept. So can we sort of try to use some well-documented genetic factor and then go back to see that whether patients carrying the same mutation, carrying the same genetic profile, are more similar to each other compared to other patients without the same genetic profile? That's the idea. So here, um, we, the example that I, I use here is that we focused on the, a, a pathway of gene uh, that are associated with the two primary neurotransmitters, glutamate and GABA, you know, one excitatory and one inhibitory neurotransmitter that have been found to be important in many neurological disorders. So we uh, do the deep sequencing, next generation sequencing for all the axons of these 84, 84 genes, and then we focus on that we only highlight that the number of rare uh, coding variants, and the reason because we believe that uh, in this situation that rare coding variant might have a greater impact on the phenotype, so compared to other common or non-coding variants. So we break them down into four bin for, all the, the, for the, the population based on their number of their accumulative coding variants. And so we have four groups here. And then the way for us to understand that whether within each bean, each group, are they more clinically similar to each other? So there, of course, there will be definitely one more, more than one approach to do that. So here we try to sort of use the, the item-based score, as Dr. Wang presented previously. You know, this has been commonly practiced in psychiatric research. So in autism, there are some uh, commonly used, uh, you know, like questionnaire that we can use to sort of to uh, help us to diagnose or to estimate the severity of the patients. So the first one is ADIR score, autism diagnostic in the, uh, inventory uh, uh, research score. And the second one is more SRS score is more focused on the social function. And the third one is more focused on the, uh, the uh, uh, aggr 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 aggression, aggressive tendency score. So each questionnaire have more than uh, 40 or even 50 items. So we believe that if we take one subpopulation and we believe that it is homogeneous, then theoretically we will be able to sort of do some sort of a, uh, item reduction method to shrink down the item into smaller number of items. So, so that the idea is that if all the, if everyone has the similar severity, then, then they can even come down to just one single score. That, I'm, I'm trying to use a very extreme example here, one item to represent everybody. So, here we use the factor analysis to try to reduce the number of item, and found that the first bean seems to have higher number of factor, and if we look at the right side bean here. Uh, the patients carry the most, the, the highest number of coding variants 
uh, they had the, the lowest number of factor after our, you know, our factor reduction kind of approach. So they kind of gave us some more confidence to say that, well, if for this particular coding variant in this, this candidate gene, when they carry sufficient number of variants, they seem to be, they seem to constitute a more homogeneous group compared to the others that carry a smaller number of coding variants. So this is another way to say that we can use this kind of approach to help us to identify the homogeneous group. So this is kind of like a snapshot of you know, what we can do about this heterogeneous. And I believe that this is, a, this is a phenomenon that is not only specific to autism, it, might, it can be applied to many kind of different kind of pediatric onset diseases as long as the, the ideologies are, are complex. So I'm gonna shift the gear here after, uh, uh, after this slide. So because the focus of today's talk is more about the gene environment action. And the reason we, we study this, not just because that the environmental factor actually might be more important than we think, but also that without uh, ignoring the environmental factor might, it might be equivalent to, you know, uh, ignoring the, the, the real, the cause of their genetic because patients are different maybe because of their different genetic profile, but also uh, maybe because of uh, their different environmental exposure. So this is one of our rationale to do this. And we're gonna focus on some specific environmental factors. You know, like I said, no, 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 I think at this point in time, nobody can really say that, okay, environmental factors are important in autism, but what are they? There are tons of, uh, you no, know, I should say me, uh, hundreds or even thousands of environmental factors that we think might, be, might, might impair a neural or brain function, but what are they? So if, as a quantitative uh, research scientist, that if we assume that there is no a prior hypothesis, we're gonna throw in all the genetic, genetic marker and all the uh, environmental factor together, then we definitely need a you know, humongous sample size to answer the question because we are, conducting more, uh, you know, like millions or even more than millions of number of tests. So we need more than just p-value 0.05 to tell us that the finding is real, not because of false positive. So, so here, we, I'm trying to introduce a way to show, uh, sort of to, to, to screen that and narrow the target of the, of the uh, gene and the environment factor. So here, I'm going to focus on the uh, medication that pregnant w w women can, you know, are prescribed during their pregnancy. So the idea is that we know there are lots of genetic factors right there, right there, and there are lots of medication that the pregnant women can be prescribed with. So we, we, we try to use a kind of convergent approach to narrow the list of a you know, more possible culprit, more, more, more likely candidate uh, compound and a gene. So in this algorithm, first we will start with a set of gene that are associated with a specific medication, specific drug. Uh, here we can present, we can throw in all, all kinds of a drug that has been classed by at least class C or A or B uh, that might be safely prescribed to pregnant women. And then so we can sort of uh, ex extract the gene, genetic target from different uh, databases. Like the first one is, is called Link Clouds. It is a database con constructed by that we give a many, uh, compound to a cell line and then we measure whether a particular gene's expression level is higher or lower compared to the cell line uh, as a com uh, comparison group. That is not, tr is not uh, stimulated by that particular compound. So that's one side of the source of the gene list we can obtain. And the second source of the gene associated with the drug come from other many kind of public databases. And most, so the second source are like the, the gene that might encode the receptors or enzyme, they can either in directly interact with the compound. So basically there are two types of genes that might play a role in this kind of gene, uh, drug related scenario here. Where so for first type of, of gene is that it's susceptible to the drug. The drug can uh, influence the expression level. And the second type of the gene is that uh, differently they, they, they provide some protein that change the metabolism of the drug. And I believe that both of these kinds of uh, genes are important in the uh, drug-related related gene. And the second set, we can extract or uh, autism associated gene. And then we can identify the of that gene, and those genes are supposedly to be uh, the prioritized gene that might interact with the drug 
prenatal exposure to the drug to influence the risk of autism. So to sort of uh, try to, the attempt trying to quantify the evidence as we know that, okay, you have one, so for example, you have 100 genes associated with the uh, ibuprofen, and you have 700 genes associated with the autism, and you found, okay, five of the genes are overlap between these two entities, and how do we make of it? What is the quantitative evidence we can talk about that? So here, uh, I'm, we, I, I borrow a concept from another different study. It's based on the uh, sort of a number of, a relative number of co uh, overlap genes between two conditions here. So it's called inclusion index. The actual mathematics is kind of straightforward. So imagine that the X entity is autism and the Y is like oh, ibuprofen. And so we can calculate the number, uh, inclusion index by uh, the number of overlap gene divided by the number of reference group. It could be autism, it could be the drug. It depends upon the question that we are asking. So this will be kind of a way to quantify that, how important that overlap genes contribute to uh, the reference group, which is autism in our case. So using that kind of a, a, a computational method, we will be able to construct, to visualize that the relationship between or different kind of medication, different kind of drug, uh, with the autism spectrum disorder. So the size of each circle will represent the number of genes associated with the entity. It could be autism, it could be uh, terbutalin or uh, prednisolone and other medication. And the uh, line between the drug and the autism, uh, we, we have two index we can think about here. The th first one is that it, the thickness of the line, if the thickness of line is thick, then, then we kind of think that that will be the number of the shared gene. The more it's shared, the thicker the line will be. And then the final is that the length of the line here. So we want to make, we want to try to visualize in the way that if the line is short, I mean they are relations are cl is closer. So it's where well, we rely on the inclusion index that I just introduced on my previous slide. So that will represent that if the line is are thick, if the line is short, then that that drug might play a bigger role in autism. And so using the kind of approach, we we use the Velpro A. Uh, it's a departing as a reference drug because it has been well sh shown that, you know, uh, in animal study, you inject the velproacin to the, to the uh, mother uh, mouse, then the risk in the pup to present the uh, lack of social interaction and kind of autism-like behavior will be much, much higher. So we use it as a reference group to show whether our visualization method really can give us the kind of idea that we want. So it seems that its line is short and the thickness is kind of, it, it's kind of like the thickest amount all the other line. So this is like a way that, okay, we can use this kind of approach to, to prioritize that what drug we should start, we should start first. So the, so we, we so I'm trying to focus on the terbutaline, uh, you know, the beta 2 adrenal receptor agonist uh, as uh, the target drug here. And one of the reasons is because recent epidemiological evidence have been telling us that this drug might be contributing to the increased risk of autism in offspring whose mother are on those kind of medication during their pregnancy. But some other epidemiological studies found the opposite association or even found no association. So we believe that that's why we think that we need to test the gene environment in action, meaning that the impact of the environment factor will be remarkable when uh, the person carries some sort of a, a genetic profile. And another line of evidence is that, so if we only look at the patients, we even believe that terbutaline is bad, is, is, is harmful to the neurodevelopmental function. We might be able to observe that, well, if we simply compare the, the exposure group versus unexposure group, that exposure groups should do poorly compared to the, the unexposure group in some neurodevelopmental function. So here we, I'm trying to use a survival analysis to sort of to estimate their, whether they are delay onset in their speech delay and, found, and, and other uh, motor development on milestone like the, the uh, age of first rolling and at for age of first sitting. And well, you know, this is a trend that yes, the exposure group seems to be doing uh, worse than the unexposure group based on our survival analysis here. And so uh, the next question is that I mean, in reality that it's really hard to sort of uh, attempt all the in, uh, information from the healthy kids that, you know, whether they have co a comprehensive documentation on their exposure history during their pregnancy, et cetera. So we, fo we, we, we kind of think that can we just do, this, do the sort of a gene environment interaction scanning in patients only. 
So the idea is that if you had a patient, well, actually, in reality, patients usually the, the information are much richer than the, the healthy control. So assuming that a genetic mutation can interact with the compound to increase the risk of that particular disease, then we might expect to see that uh, if we only look at the control, since they are not affected with or without the exposure history, that particular allele frequency should be the same. It's irrelevant. But if it's on that genetic mutation is only relevant when it you know, co occur with the exposure status, we will expect to see that allele frequency of the of the exposure group will be much higher than an exposure group. So, so you can see that even simply looking at the case only population, we will be able to see that for any allele, any genetic variable with the allele frequency that can be drastically different between the exposure group and non-exposure group might be the gene that have the potential to uh, interact with the, our environment factor. So using the kind of approach, we identify several genes that pass the threshold of you know, genome association study. Uh, we used the p-value uh, you know, uh, 10 to the minus 8, and we found a couple of different genes here that might uh, meet the criteria that, that, might, that their allele frequency are drastically different between the exposed group and non-exposed group. But we need to narrow down further by a previous approach we just mentioned that. So we want to make sure that that gene meet the criteria, the characteristics that it is among the overlap gene between the drug and the, auti and, and the autism. So it turned out that only ST7 gene survived. ST7 gene actually is very no a novel gene in terms of autism risk gene because it actually is a tumor suppressor gene. And only a very handful of studies showing that it might be a candidate gene for autism. So if we try to further, further to quantify the evidence. So the evidence is that if we only look at the gene associated with the drug and whether that list of genes are overrepresented or enriched in autism genes. So this is a very similar idea to calculate that, the, the pathway analysis. So we can break it down into four groups. The gene interacts with tributylene and non tributylene and the gene associated with the autism and non and non-related to autism, we can have a four two by two cell here, and then we can use the hypergeometrical distribution to calculate the p-value, whether it's the, the, the kind of a bias distribution is significant. So we'll be able to narrow down that. This is another line to say the ST7 gene might be interesting finding in terms of the gene enrichment uh, analysis. And people might be wondering there, so why, why, why don't we just use a more straightforward analysis? We just you know, compare the gene expression profile of uh, exposure group versus non-exposure group, and then be done with it. But the, the, the reality is that you know, in human subjects, usually we cannot really directly uh, do that kind of experiment, especially if we believe that gene expression study only hold true when we are studying the brain-specific gene expression, which will make it more difficult to do that kind of uh, in vivo study. So here, when, um, you know, again, we try to throw that overlap gene into the pathway analysis, and that, that the data tell us that whether it is overrepresented in particularly molecular or physiological pathway, and turn out that it, it, the, the number one pathway is actually associated with the hematopolo uh, hematological system development and function. So again, that another different kind of a way to look at a gene expression it also support that the, the hematopoietic and employed the organ development seems to be one of the gene expression if we only tag compare the gene expression profile based on the peripheral blood cell. But again, not a perfect approach because we are talking about the peripheral blood cell expression here, but if they are consistent, kind of a, like provide a more convergent line evidence. So, um, so, so up till now, we kind of get a feel that, well, the ST7 gene, if it is real, it really interacts with the, that environmental factor. And seems that two different kind of gene expression analysis tell us that something to do with the uh, blood, uh, blood cell development function, then now maybe, you know, some of the audience might be wondering, so if this is true, do we expect to see that uh, kids with autism have a higher risk of blood cancer, blood-related tumor-related uh, uh, tumor condition? So some evidence, sporadic evidence here, I'm not sure if they are very strong, but they are interesting. So, well, first we want to know that tumor suppressor genes is the ST7 gene is not the only exception. There are some other tumor suppressor genes have uh, found to be associated with the uh, impaired neural differentiation. And also that if we talk about a drug, that the particular tributary drug, the beta allergic stimuli, it also associated with the tumor uh, uh, oncogenesis. Uh, so we put them together. The next, question, the next thing we want to know is that, well, in terms of the epi epidemiologic evidence, there are some uh, Population-specific uh, studies show that uh, the, the 
the autism uh, children might have higher risk of some, some particular kind of uh, hematological cancer. And of course, this is based on the epidemiological study. We haven't figured out whether the compoundary have been resolved. But these are these are kind of a converge in a way that maybe that's why we see the ST7 gene in our particular study. And but it, when we didn't see the conver, uh, consistent finding in other study, the next question we might be asking is that ST7 gene is important in in autism only when the patient has the uh, exposure history. Or related to uh, tubulin or other uh, beta-2 adrenergic receptor agonist. So, I mean, and to summarize that, this kind of give us idea that this might be uh, like, you know, we can, we can do kind of like uh, uh, in situ screening based on the you know, multiple platform gene expression profile and the gene and, the, and, and other different kind of genetic uh, databases and put together to identify uh, some, uh, you know, novel candidate uh, drug and gene that might work together to increase the risk of autism. But I, I believe that some of them might be wondering, so, but we didn't really factor in the expression direction, right? I mean, even though they have shared gene, but maybe the drug, uh, if your cell line is in, uh, stimulated by ibuprofen, but the gene is actually is overexpressed, which is underexpressed in the autism, and does that still count that is the gene environment, the action that might be questionable? So the next step, we should factor in that we should use the cell line, the direction of extreme inspection to sort of, uh, to further narrow down the list of the gene that we are Talk about here, so th that will be the next uh, uh, research direction that we should work on. That so ultimately, I'm trying. I, I I think to kind of sum up the my talk is that they're actually without to without doing kind of a in vivo study based on especially based on many kind of limitation and plausibility of the human based uh, research we, I just mentioned. That I think actually uh, there are a lot of data out there. Um, there are stored in the cloud or in different kind of uh, public database, uh, pu public databases and all that, and we can use them together to narrow down a list of our a target, and we can either further to use the uh, data re re reduction method to identify the ultimate set of predictor for the outcome to see whether there is gene environment in action, or we can use the target and to, in, and, to, and to design the in vivo study to further to really to validate the finding. So for example, if we believe the ST7 gene is the real thing that interact with the, with the drug, the next step might be to trying to do an animal model to evaluate that. When we put the two things together, we inject the, the uh, tributary to the, to the mother, uh, then we, are we expect to see that the gene expression in the pulp, in, in, the, in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the offspring, exhibit in the same way that we expect, that we predict based on our uh, in situ screening. So I'm going to stop my presentation here, and I appreciate your attention. Thank you. Thank you. So questions, please, from the audience. Right, so for the whole population, we start with actually we do not exclude anyone with or without the delay, as long as they carry a diagnosis of autism. So we, we try to allow them to get kind of a uh, critical their genetics inside the population. Second question. Uh, you said that uh, every single autism has been recorded. How do you show more frequency in the body of the outcoded or not recorded outcoded? Another separate study to look at this question, but I think it would be nice if we can put them together. So the question is that uh, some evidence shows that older fathers, when the child is, 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 is conceived, uh, seems to have higher risk of autism and other drugs that are important. Mm -hmm. And there are many different hypotheses flying around. One of the hypotheses is that uh, the, the older germline male seems to have a higher mutation rate. Mm -hmm. So there are some evidence showing that Show that if we only look at, like, for example, we look at all the kids and we don't look at their speech, speech, uh, speech uh, language development problems, uh, personal age, all the, all the father's age is not a very strong predictor. And the uh, one of the explanations is that uh, the you know, older fathers, even though they might have, say, they have higher mutation rate in their germline, but they also have other protective factors, like they 
what's the problem? Is arguably associated with the better socioeconomic status and more parenting experience. So those things are kind of a, if we look at those factors, then actually might sort of mediate an effect that in terms of the relationship built on the other things. So uh, I believe that we probably need a systematic study designed to look at more for consumers, the group, to see whether what does really, what does the older generation really do in the, the you know, genome or the, the brain development. That is very uh, interesting to look at. Yes, please. Not children. Yeah, that's a good one. <laughs> okay. Right. Right. So yeah. Well, first of all, I want to thank you for sharing uh, the, uh, the the your son's uh, situation. And I think that's very important. Usually, that I mean, the parents, the, uh, the thoughts on that, the, on the on the patient actually say more than most of the research. And so, the answer to your first question that why do we focus on tributary? Uh, that's a, this is a tricky question because well, initially we kind of uh, focused on the medication that had been prescribed more commonly before for the kids born bet uh, before 90s, and we found that. Tributary seems to be com quite commonly prescribed back then, and I think the one of the most important, uh, most common reason is because to the, the the doctor, the gynecologist, uh, the, uh, the tactician try to avoid the premature labor. They use that, you know, temporary use. That's one thing, and the other thing is, like you said, well, if the, I mean, the mother has the asthma or other cardiovascular problem, that might also be the indication to use the tributary. 
But recently, I think at least after 2000, the, the FDA and the U.S. kind of think that the, the tributyl can kind of do more harm than respect on mother. So it has been down to from class C to even lower than class C, but I need to double check that. And because of the risk in mother, not in the offspring. So, so uh, animal study also support that tributylin increase the adrenergic tone also will increase the, new, the, 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 the cell, the mitosis in some tissue, including the brain. And as we know that, well, one of the, one of the epidemiological evidence is that the bigger has circumference or is also, might be also a risk factor for autism, and big has circumference usually will indicate that, well, some overproduction of some brain tissue in some, some part of the brain. And so this, this line of evidence come together kind of gave us thinking that tributylin or other similar drug might be the environmental factor we should consider. But in, in my uh, approach here, I'm trying to sort of, let's throw all the medication we can find on some population and to compare their impact on autism based on the approach that I mentioned that to compare the overlap gene between the drug and the autism. So we can kind of quantify that, well, whether tributylin is really uh, come a target that we should invest more an, uh, effort into studying the impact on autism. So it seems that among other medications, uh, antibiotics or, or you know steroid and other thing, that tributin seems to be quite at least a moderate uh, modifier on some genetic some kind of gene associated with autism. But but like I say, I mean after all we have done here, we still cannot comfortably say that, well, yes, tributylin really interact with some gene to increase the risk of autism we, because we rely on a lot of indirect lines of evidence put together and kind of give us some sort of a, a suggestion. So I would, I would believe that it's too early to conclude that a particular drug taken during the pregnancy really can increase the risk of autism un, unless next day we use the animal model to, you know, to well control other background and then to test whether the, some, the gene, gene expression has been perturbed by the compound and that kind of changes the expression gene also lead to the you know, autism-like behavior in the animal model, then we will be more comfortable to say, yes, this might be the, the real finding. Uh, any other comments? So before we move up, I would like to make a comment. First of all, thank you for excellent presentation. Secondly, yes, as I uh, showed in um, my opening speech in the first day, we have a higher prevalence of autism worldwide. I think because this is happening, because we are moving to a more chemical environment, so epigenomics, okay, will be I an issue in which we can have mutations that can bring us to conditions like that. The second thing is I would like to thank uh, our colleague for sharing this important private uh, data and say that if we really want to improve the quality of life and health, we need to find solutions to adopt people with special qualities in our society. And this is something that must be led by pediatricians. I think that what we do not understand is that we are not only scientists for the health issues of children. We are advocates for a better future. And I think that we need to focus on that also. And in international conferences, we need to bring up this topic. So I think we can move now to the next speaker. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, 